As we get started today, I have something important that I want to say. I get it. I know that many of you are angry. You're angry about the degradation of the morals in society in the LGBTQIA2 plus movement. You're angry about the reckless attitude towards abortion. You're angry about children that are being given puberty blockers and surgeries before they're even old enough to get a driver's license and yet are being allowed to make life-altering decisions with their bodies that many of them will regret shortly after. But it's too late because you can't reverse those decisions and the godless, immoral people are taking over the country and we can't let them do it because we need to fight for God and for country. I get it, but what I don't get is why so many Adventists don't see what's happening right now. And that thing is that many Christians today are trying to use the government to legislate morality, even going so far as to put in writing their plan to legislate a day of rest, and even going so far as to say that the separation of church and state is a lie. Well, first of all, there is no separation clause. It doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution. There's no such thing as a separation of church and state. The church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk that's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter and it means nothing like what they say it does. Why are so many of us not seeing that what's really happening is that the image of the beast is being formed today? My goal is to make an appeal that we need to wake up. We need to see what's happening. We need to start talking about it more directly the way that Adventists like A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner in the late 1880s talked about the push to establish national Christianity, or as they call it today, Christian nationalism. Adventists talked about it in the late 1880s in the American Sentinel. Adventists talked about it as recently as 2009 in the article from Liberty Magazine entitled The American Sentinel and the Crusade to Nationalize Christianity. And it's happening again now. There are a group of Protestants trying to push national Christianity with Christian nationalism, and we need to say something about it. There's a hidden quote from the 1888 version of the Great Controversy. It's been hiding in plain sight for almost 140 years. I only noticed it last year when I was working on the series and book that we just produced entitled Daniel 11 and 7. But before I get to the quote, I want to show you a few things, starting with a clip from a History Channel documentary discussing the early Christians in this country as it relates to Sunday laws. And this is going to set the stage for what we're going to talk about today. So sit back, strap in, and let's take a look together. But by the late 1500s, the Puritans in England and America's first colonies proved to be as strict as the Pharisees in observing the Sabbath. These were theocratic communities. These were communities that thought they were establishing the rule of God here on earth. And they wanted to follow what they considered to be God's law. In Massachusetts Bay in the 1600s, simply not working on Sunday was not enough. You couldn't laugh. You couldn't play. You were expected to walk reverently back and forth from church, and that was about it. Unnecessary walking, riding, playing on musical instruments, boating, swimming, and courting were all crimes punishable by fines, whipping, ear slitting, or hours in the stocks. And there's even one instance that's recorded in which a sea captain came back after a long uh, interval at sea and kissed his wife on the Sabbath and was severely reprimanded. As the colonies became the United States, the Sabbath laws remained on the books. In 1789, authorities in Connecticut detained a party for riding on a Sunday. One of the travelers turned out to be George Washington on official business. Even the President of the United States was not above the laws of God. There you have it. From the very inception of this country, there was a desire to make this a so-called Christian nation. But that term Christian nation can mean so many different things, depending on who's using the term. 
but in my humble opinion, many that use that term use it to mean this. It's a quote taken from Desire of Ages and it says, but today in the religious world, there are multitudes who, as they believe, are working for the establishment of the kingdom of Christ as an earthly and temporal dominion. They desire to make our Lord the ruler of the kingdoms of this world, the ruler in its courts and camps, its legislative halls, its palaces and marketplaces. They expect him to rule through legal enactments enforced by human authority. Since Christ is not now here in person, they themselves will undertake to act in his stead to execute the laws of his kingdom. The establishment of such a kingdom is what the Jews desired in the days of Christ. They would have received Jesus had he been willing to establish a temporal dominion to enforce what they regarded as the laws of God and to make them the expositors of his will and the agents of his authority. But he said, my kingdom is not of this world. He would not accept the earthly throne. There are many that are looking for the United States to be a sort of quasi theocracy. And as I said, it's been this way from the country's beginning with people being punished and placed in the stocks for not respecting the so-called Lord's day. Look at the sentiments of some of the Christian leaders. This is God's nation and nobody is going to take it away from him. If this is God's country and nobody is going to take it from him, then why not put someone in the stocks for not keeping the so-called Lord's day? The problem is that it's clear from John 18 verse 36 that Jesus never asked to be the ruler of this world in its current state. He said that his kingdom is not of this world. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 6 verse 15, it records the story of something that Jesus saw bubbling in his day. He saw it bubbling and he ran from it. He avoided it like the plague. And it says that when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. I hope you caught that. They tried to take Jesus by force and make him king. And you're about to see that this is what many Protestants have been trying to do for over 160 years, which is to take Jesus by force of government and make him king and ruler of this world and this nation. It was because of this reality that Ellen White made the following statement in her day on page 573 of The Great Controversy. It says, in the movements now in progress in the United States to secure for the institutions and usages of the church the support of the state, Protestants are following in the steps of papists. Now, I want to show you a screenshot of this quote so that you can see what was in the original text of the 1888 version of The Great Controversy. And by the way, I'm not saying that the 1911 version is bad. It's a statement to see Appendix Note 11. And this brings us to the appendix. And it is here that we will spend a little bit of our time today. This portion of the appendix was written in response to something called the National Reform Association, also known as the NRA. According to the Great Controversy Appendix, Ellen White's statement that we just read was in response to the National Reform Association. It says, these movements are apparent under diverse forms and in different ways, but the organization which embodies almost every form and works in every way to gain its end is the National Reform Association. It originated in a conference representing 11 different denominations of Christians from seven of the states of the Union. It now has the support of prominent men from all branches of the church, of the National Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Prohibition Party. It proposes to have our national constitution amended in order to quote, constitute a Christian government, acknowledging God as the source of all authority and power in civil government, the Lord Jesus Christ as the ruler among the nations, his revealed will as the supreme law of the land, and so placing all Christian laws, institutions, and usages of our government on an undeniable legal basis in the fundamental law of the land. Now don't miss this. Number one, it says that they were a conference representing 11 different denominations from all branches of the church. Number two, they had the support of prominent men from all branches of the church. Number three, the National Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Prohibition Party were heavily involved, which means that the morals of society played a huge role in this movement. Number four, they wanted to have the constitution amended. And number five, they wanted to place all Christian laws, institutions, and usages of our government on an undeniable legal basis in the fundamental law of the land.
I want you to understand that these statements are not just wild theories concocted by Adventists in the lab of the Great Controversy. You can see it from the Wikipedia page of the National Reform Association that says that it was formerly known as the National Association to secure the religious amendment of the United States Constitution. And please don't miss this one. Their original name declared their goal, which was to amend the Constitution, to add the following amendment. We the people would acknowledge Almighty God as the source of all authority and power in civil government, the Lord Jesus Christ as the ruler among the nations, his revealed will as the supreme law of the land in order to constitute a Christian government. That was the same statement from the appendix of the great controversy. This is what Ellen White was talking about when she said, in the movements now in progress in the United States to secure for the institutions and usages of the church, the support of the state, Protestants are following in the steps of papists. And if you didn't realize it, these movements have once again reemerged in the form of movements such as Project 2025, the same Project 2025 that we talked about in an episode of The Prophetic Eye. This is the key principle behind the Christian nationalism movement that is actively looking to legislate Sunday as a day of worship. And take a look for yourself. As I understand Christian nationalism, it is that the idea that, that you your nation self-identifies, understands itself as Christian, and they would pursue uh, their good as Christians, which would in include policies that would kind of in encourage people to attend church, uh, encourage um, people to uh, seek out essentially the mean, means of grace. So mm -hmm. this would include things like, I think, Sabbath laws, which would um, on, on Sundays would essentially, uh, we can talk about this more, but it essentially kind of close down businesses and uh, an emergency and essential services. And that would be a way of not forcing people to attend church or do any sort of worship, but it would be kind of a, rem a reminder for the people that this is what this day is for yeah. um, and you should do it. This is no different from what took place roughly 140 years ago that pushed Adventists to start the monthly publication, The American Sentinel, which we know today as Liberty Magazine. Pioneers such as Joseph H. Wagner, E.J. Wagner, and A.T. Jones successfully fought against these movements back then playing their role to slow the formation of the image of the beast, slowing the union of church and state, and prompting Ellen White in an 1885 message to say, let none sit in calm expectation of the evil, comforting themselves with the belief that this work of the national reform movement must go on because prophecy has foretold it and that the Lord will shelter his people. We are not doing the will of God if we sit in quietude, doing nothing to preserve liberty of conscience. Now I want you to understand what was driving this desperation among the Protestants to change the constitution and inaugurate Christ as the King of the United States of America. In this article from the 2009 edition of Liberty Magazine that I already mentioned, it says, the general ethos shared by the leading Protestant denominations remained the dominant moral influence in the late 19th century America, but manifold and rapidly accelerating dangers threatened that dominance, the crime, vice, and poverty rampant in overcrowded cities, the huge influx of immigrants boosting the power base of Roman Catholicism, the influence of secular values in the universities, and the large corporations that held sway over the new industrial economy, the decline of morality, crime, vice, immigrants, secular values taking over. Does any of that sound familiar? These are the same rallying calls regarding the decline of the United States that we're hearing today, driving people to say that we need to get back to God. The Liberty Magazine article goes on to say that in response to these issues in the 1880s, the Christian nation advocates, or the Christian lobby, to borrow a label from the historian Gaines Foster, sought to advance the reign of Christ over the nation by means of legislation, more precisely, federal legislation. While a constitutional amendment remained central to their program, the Christian lobbyists did not wait for its passage to push for other legislation on behalf of numerous aspects of moral behavior, most notably sobriety and Sabbath observance. They wanted a Christian nation, and Protestants today that have aligned themselves with Christian nationalism and Project 2025 want exactly the same thing. In the late 1880s, national Christian reformers said government must enforce upon all that come among us the laws of Christian morality. 
Another announced by the Reverend E.B. Graham is that if the opponents of the Bible do not like our government and its Christian features, let them go to some wild, desolate land and in the name of the devil and for the sake of the devil, subdue it and set up a government of their own infidel and atheistic ideas. And then, if they can stand it, stay there till they die. Another announced by Jonathan Edwards, DD, is that Jews and all Christians who keep the seventh day are to be classed as atheists and must be treated as for this national reform question, one party with atheists who cannot dwell together on the same continent with the national reform Christianity. I want you to understand that those who hold these ideals of national Christianity or Christian nationalism are no friend of atheists, and eventually they will be no friend of Sabbath keepers either. The spirit of this movement is encapsulated in the statement quoted from the Great Controversy Appendix from one of those that was fighting for a Christian nation. It says, a true theocracy is yet to come and the enthronement of Christ in law and lawmakers. Hence, I pray devoutly as a Christian patriot for the ballot in the hands of women. And if you don't know what a Christian patriot is, then take a look at the modern day version to understand. It's, I think, an incredible concept to name a church, Patriot Church, basically stating in the name that we love God, but we also love this country and we're gonna fight for it. When I started Patriot Church, I knew I would garner a ton of criticism from the, those that don't believe in Christ and from many, many Christians. What I'm doing is so non-existent and being this blatant about it, talking about things pertaining to the country. Heavenly Father, we pray for the service today. We want God in America again. And so Lord, use us as Patriot Church, as America's church, which I pray that pastors would, would wake up and start fighting the good fight. We love you and praise you. And if you love Jesus and the United States, say, Amen. Amen. This sentiment is growing rapidly in this country and we have to pay attention to it. The statement from the Great Controversy Appendix goes on to say, the kingdom of Christ must enter the realm of law through the gateway of politics. There are enough temperance men in both the Democratic and Republican parties to take possession of the government and give us national prohibition in the party of the near future, which is to be the party of God. We pray heaven to give them no rest until they shall swear an oath of allegiance to Christ in politics and march in one great army up to the poles to worship. This was the sentiment in the late 1880s, and this spirit is what paved the way for Senator Henry Blair to introduce a Sunday rest bill in 1888. And here we are again with a group of Christians that are getting increasingly powerful and that are seeking to push for the exact same thing. It's literally in the document for everyone to read themselves, and they're saying it publicly. So what do you have to say about this? Other Christians who are not Adventists are speaking up about this. Even many atheists, although obviously they have their own separate agenda, grounded in rejecting God at all costs, they are sounding the alarm about these movements. And so I ask you again, what do you have to say about this? Do you believe that this is much ado about nothing? Or are you like me that can clearly see the winds that have been held for so long are being let go. Some may say that they're being let go slowly. Some may say that they're being let go quickly. But I believe that we all need to at least agree that they are indeed being let go. And so, how should we feel about the reemergence of the spirit of the National Reform Association, formerly known as the National Association to secure the religious amendment of the United States Constitution, which was an organization that was trying to introduce a Christian amendment into the US Constitution in order to make the United States a Christian state. Many of you are familiar with the statement that the principles of the Constitution are going to be repudiated. So, how should we feel about that? I think this statement just about sums it up. Not by the decisions of courts or councils or legislative assemblies, not by the patronage of worldly great men is the kingdom of Christ established, but the implanting of Christ's nature in humanity through the work of the Holy Spirit. Christ is primarily looking for us to reach hearts. I don't believe it's my place to tell people whether or not they should vote or who they should vote for, but I do know 
that we need to use our influence to hold back the emergence of the image to the beast so that we can continue to have the freedom to share the gospel. And if you've seen the value of that today, then I want to invite you to say to the YouTube algorithm that this is important and that you want this message shared with as many as possible. And you can do that by liking the video, leaving a comment on the video, and sharing the video with others so that these digital tracks can reach as many eyes and ears as possible. Because it is clear to me that just as Revelation chapter 13 states, he, meaning the Christian nationalists and Christian patriots, had power to give life unto the image of the beast. And when this image is fully formed, it will end with the removal of the separation of church and state and the removal of religious liberties. God bless.